Uh, we're very lucky to have our town historian and past selectman Bob Russell here who will uh, give us a bit of an um, overview and guide us on, on the tour. We're also very lucky that we have five reenactors here, a very <laughs> special inhabitants. Um, so they will, in, you will just walk around the cemetery and they will introduce themselves to you and give a little brief history of their, um, their lives here as founding families in Wilton. So thank you once again. And um, also just a little plug that Sharp Hill Cemetery is owned and managed by the Congregational Church. Um, it was established in 1738. Cemetery. The cemetery was, <coughs> yes, here. And it's one of the oldest cemeteries that's still maintained by the original church um, in really Fairfield County. So, but Bob, we'll pass you over to Bob and he will. Did you tell us who you are? I'm sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> She's my neighbor. I, I'm Pamela Brown. I'm the executive administrator. <laughs> of Wilton Congregational Church, Hillside Cemetery, and Sharp Hill Cemetery. Yeah. And we have our Historical Society partners, yes. Allison. And Allison Kim. And Kim. 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 Kim's Kim. here somewhere. Allison Kim Sanders. Sanders. We're and very happy to co-sponsor this as we did the uh, don't, Hillside don't Cemetery. Don't trip over that stone, but yeah, just you. be careful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so come visit us at the Historical Society. We're right down the road. Thank you. This is a kind of a record crowd for a this cemetery sure walk. So I just have a few, so if, if families can share these, that would be great. Okay, there was someone asking. Okay, I'm uh, off. I'm going to stand in the shade for a while and you'll get cold. So then we're quickly going to move to the various grave sites. And we have six people reenacting uh, the lives of people that are buried here. So that Elizabeth Davenport, Elizabeth Davenport Gaylord is buried here, and this is Elizabeth Davenport Gaylord. So after, <laughs> I, after I finish telling you a little bit about the history of the cemetery, uh, you'll go around on your own to the different six locations, and there are five people with recognizable gravestones, and then there'll be somebody standing next to a unmarked stone because. They're about a, in this cemetery. There are about 150 legible gravestones. There are also about 150 blocks of stone, or just upright flagstones that don't have names on them. Did they ever? Did they disappear? Probably not. In many cases, people couldn't afford to pay for a, a carver to carve a stone, and so they just buried them and put a vertical marker. And we have a vague idea who some of them were, but in many cases we don't know. And the earliest church, earliest congregational church in Wilton was in 1726 up on Wolf Pit Road. And uh, it only lasted about a dozen years because they outgrew, the congregation outgrew the church. And so they built the second church right here, right, right on that hillside, which did not used to be so steep. It was a nice building, and in the Wilton history book, there's an artist's conception of what the second church looked like, uh, and behind it, they established the cemetery. Second church was built here, 1738 to 1740, and the cemetery was started in 1738. It was a gift of land from a man named John Marvin. Uh, some of you might know, up next to the high school, there's a Marvin Tavern which is one of the old buildings on the historic register. And uh, it's, a it's one of the series, long series of Marvin families that lived in Wilton. Uh, a number of them are buried at the Hillside Cemetery. But it was uh, John Marvin who gave this 64 square rods of land. Now, if you don't know what a rod is, you can go look it up, but it's a very convenient <laughs> piece of measurement because an even number of rods made an acre, and another even number of rods made a square mile, and uh, it was a convenient measure that they used. And it was also easy to carry a 16 and a half foot rope, because that's what a rod is, 16 and a half feet, to measure off properties. So, uh, the, uh, I started to tell you that there was another cemetery around the first building, the 1726 building up on Wolf Pit Road. And when they moved down here in 1738, 
uh, they sold the old building, somebody tore it down or moved it, and it disappeared. And they all forgot there was a cemetery there. Now jump ahead 150 years, not quite, 125 years, and they built the railroads from Norwalk up to Danbury. And they came through the graveyard that used to be by the original church. And uh, the poor Irish workers were so unnerved by what they dug up that they had to go to the local tavern for re refreshments to calm their nerves. Of course they did. <laughs> and so there were a number of skeletons there of early deaths of the congregation members. And one of our reenactors is reenacting Jonathan Wood, who was one of the very first members of the church in 1726. And we think he's buried, or his remains that were scraped up after they were dug up, <laughs> were reburied over here. Uh, and then, I think I've told you about 150 legible stones, all the old families in Wilton, Abbott, Belden, DeForest, Dudley, Fitch, Gaylord, Gilbert, Betts, Olmsted, Raymond, St. John, all those old families have representatives buried here. And we do have a total list. I created an inventory several years ago of all the stones that we could read. And uh, so we have that available in the library and I guess probably at the church. And uh, of, the, of the entire list, yes. great. Wow. But good luck finding people though. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that helps a lot is you get here when the sun angle is, is correct, you can read the inscriptions a lot easier if the sun's coming at an angle or even directly on it. And we're unfortunately in the shade right now. Uh, so I think I'll let the reenactors take off, and, and uh, Myra is reenacting two, and uh, oh, you, Madeline, you're Madeline, Madeline mm -hmm. reenacting one, and you'll find other other flags, and Pam's put bigger bigger flags around too. So you don't all have to stay in one place. You can, you know, mix around to the six locations and make sure you see them all. I am Elizabeth Davenport Gaylord. I was born in 1708 and died in 1747. I was born in Stamford, and I am the daughter of Reverend John Davenport, who was pastor in Stamford from 1694 to 1731. My great-grandfather, another Reverend John Davenport, was one of the founders of New Haven in 1638, and I am a fourth-generation American. I was raised in a very religious family. My three sisters are also married to ministers, and one of my brothers became a minister. My sister Sarah married Reverend Eliezer Wheelock, who became the first president of Dartmouth. My brother James became an evangelistic preacher who was not welcomed by traditional conservative congregationalists of the time. Reverend James Davenport used to denounce the Connecticut clergymen because he said, that they were unconverted, and he would confront them in public, demanding to know if they had been saved. Well, after putting up with this for a little while, he was then arrested and deported to Long Island, where he continued to stir up trouble, but far away from my family, so there were no, no issues there. My brother Abraham Davenport had a distinguished career in public service. He was elected from Stamford to the Colonial Assembly, Assembly in Hartford and continued as a state senator after independence was declared. He was the Senate leader on the dark day of May 19, 1780, when an eclipse blackened the sky and convinced the population that the day of judgment had come. His fellow senators were in a panic and clamored to adjourn. And Abraham calmly said, it is either the day of judgment or it is not. If it is not, we have no cause to adjourn. And if it is, I choose to be found doing my duty. Let them bring the candles. My brother John was an ancestor of the Wilton branch of the Davenport family. My brothers James, James and Abraham both graduated from Yale and introduced me to a fellow Yale student, William Gaylord, and I married him in 1733, shortly before he was officially installed as the second minister in Wilton. Although he had been preaching there since the mid-1730s, Wilton had not been pleased with their first minister, Reverend Robert Sturgeon, who had been asked to leave in 1731 
probably due to his Calvinistic doctrine, which did not sit well with the original Congregationalists in Wilton. One of the many first steps taken by my husband, Reverend Gaylord, was to buy a ledger book and take a consensus of every man, woman, and child who at every baptism, marriage, new member, dismissal, and death during his 35 years here. He's one of the longest serving ministers in Wilton. His record book is still with us today in the church safe. Reverend Gaylord was very popular and within three years of, her, of his arrival, the society needed a larger meeting house. In 1738, John Marvin gave the society this land at Sharp Hill where a new meeting house and cemetery were built. William and I had seven children four of whom died young and are probably buried here under some of those simple field stones surrounding us. If you take a look, there's a semicircle of them right back there. I don't know for sure if that is their official spots. Uh, William, um, sorry, uh, another son, Moses, died in the French and Indian War, and I died at the age of 38. William duly entered my death in his ledger, saying, a good God made her a good wife to me. Her death is a sore loss to me and my dear children, but I trust in God who has ordered it. Five years later, William married Elizabeth Bishop, who bore him an additional six children. Two of them died young and are probably also buried here in this cemetery. Another son, Deodate, served in the revolution and was the ancestor of John Gaylord Davenport, a well-known Wiltonian and author of the Wilton Song, who lived in the latter half of the 19th century. Reverend William Gaylord died in 1767 and was buried several rows to the rear from me. If you go diagonally that way, he was not, mar not buried near to either one of his wives, Elizabeth. And there is no, no, reason. no reason for that and no one knows quite why. But that is my history. Did, did she Thank die you. Of so my name is Mabel Comstock Elmer. I was born Mahitable but I think I preferred Mabel. I was born in 1722, and in 1742, I married Samuel Elmer, son of Deacon Jonathan Elmer, who was one of our 31 church founders in 1726. Jonathan and Mary Elmer came from Windsor, Connecticut to Norwalk in 1716 to the Wilton area in 1721, where they bought a farm of 80 acres in the area where you might know the present riding club is. Their house was on Ridgefield Road near Drum Hill, and they had a family of 10 children, six boys and four girls. Samuel was the third child born in 1720 in Norwalk. Unfortunately, Samuel and I had less than two years together as I died in childbirth January 25, 1744, at age 22. My gravestone is the oldest one in all of Wilton. George Washington was only 12 years old at the time of my death. My gravestone inscription, which you can read in the, in the good light, I'll read it here because I have it typed up too. It reads, she gives life, but oh, pitiable consideration, gives it at ye expense of her own, and at once becomes a mother and a corpse. Less than eight months later, my little, my little daughter Mabel also died and is buried next to me. Two years after that, my husband Samuel, along with most of the other members of the Elmer family, moved to the recently opened town of Sharon, Connecticut, where fresh land was plentiful. He remarried there and later served with distinction as Colonel of the Revolution and as Sharon's represent representative to the legislature. legislature. One of my stepsons, Samuel Jr., was killed at Westport in the Battle of Jen. After the war, Samuel was a founder of the town of Elmore, Vermont, and lived to the age of 85. Thank you. Thank you. I'm playing the role of Matthew Gregory. I'm not in costume. Apparently, the real Matthew was tied up today somewhere else, so <laughs> <laughs> couldn't make it. <laughs> Matthew Gregory, born in 1680, lived to be 97 and died in 1777 after the Revolutionary War had started. His wife was Hannah Keeler of another old Wilton family. Lots of Keelers around. Uh, don't know if there are any in this cemetery, but they're certainly in, in the Hillside Cemetery. 
the Gregory's, Matthew actually was a grandson of the original settler, one of the original settlers in Norwalk. And uh, they came up here. He built the house on Belden Hill where Rip Gregory still lives. So uh, probably in 1740 to 1760, sometime around there, uh, Matthew built that house and raised his family there. And uh, there were Gregory's all over Wilton in many different locations. The, the house where Belden Hill and Richfield Road split up there was a Gregory house. In fact, one of his uh, descendants, Daniel. Daniel lived there. You should do this oh, out. <laughs> Daniel Gregory lived in that house. And when the British went up and raided Danbury and destroyed the Americans, supplies up there and came down, had a big battle in Ridgefield against uh, General Benedict Arnold, who was still a good guy at that time. And then they came down Ridgefield Road and they stopped at a number of houses and they got to the Daniel Gregory house at that intersection. The British went in and Grandma Gregory shook her poker at the British. And they asked her later, why did you shake her poker at the British? She said, I wanted to show them which side I was on. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, one of his sons was a keeper, one of Matthew's sons, Ezra, was a keeper of the military supplies up in Danbury, but he died the year before the British sent the raid up there, Tryon's raid. I wonder if it might have come out any different if he had still lived, I don't know. But of course they destroyed, the British destroyed all those American supplies that were in Danbury. And you want to know, you wonder how they knew about that. Well, there were spies all over the place back then, <laughs> just like in every war. And so the patriots that lived in Connecticut, and there were a lot of them, were telling the British everything that was going on. So they knew that the supplies were up there. And that's how they sent General Tryon out with the troops to burn them up in, up in Danbury. Uh, a <clears throat> number of other, his, one son, Ezra, was uh, in charge of the supplies up there. And as I said, he died in 1776 before the war had really gotten started. Had a number of uh, sons and grandsons. Four grandsons were in the Revolutionary War. And I can't read these stones just yet, but uh, some of the sons who were in the Revolution are here or in stones behind me. These are replacement stones, that's why they look so good, even though he died in 1777. Sometime probably around 1900, maybe a little earlier, the Gregory family replaced the old stones. And if you look around, you'll find scattered pieces of old stones around that might be original Gregory stones. But uh, they wanted to have nice stones, so they replaced them. Now, if you turn around, you'll see some stones that are also marking a very famous Wilton family. The first one here on the right is David Lambert, and that's his foot stone. So the headstone, you have to walk around to see it, but just stay here for a minute. It's easier to read the foot stone than the headstone. <laughs> and David Lambert built the house down there at Lambert Corners, which is... Uh, uh, Wilton Historical Society historic site. Mm -hmm. The original house is still there that he built in uh, 1727 or thereabouts and moved his wife, Lurany. Lurany's the next stone to the left and then one of the daughters is the third stone. And uh, they had, uh, I think, three children. Uh, one, the daughter married a Patriot. Uh, the son was a loyalist. So there's an example of a family, the Lambert family. It was broken up during the revolution. One was on one side, one was on the other. Uh, and in fact, during the revolution, uh, David Jr., David Lambert Jr., was, wasn't was really locked up, but he was uh, uh, kind of censured for supporting the British. <clears throat> so anyhow, if you go around the other side, you can see the the uh, headstones for the three Lamberts. And there's some other Lamberts here too, but those are the ones most visible.
right. Would you like to hear about Ezekiel Hawley? Yes. Okay. All right. So this is Ezekiel's gravestone here, and that is Sarah Betts, who technically I'm playing, and Sarah was his wife. So Ezekiel was born in Ridgefield in 1746, the son of Elijah Hawley and grandson of Reverend Thomas Hawley, the first pastor of Ridgefield. He married Sarah Betts of Wilton in 1771. He lost her when she was 19 years old in 1772. He had a stone carver, John Zuricker, make her handsome gravestone, and he left his signature on it near the ground. And if you look carefully, you can see that down there. He may have carved other stones here, but no others have been found with his signature. After Sarah's death, Ezekiel married Eleanor Olmsted, daughter of Wilton Militia Leader Lieutenant Samuel Olmsted, who is also buried here. Samuel was a fourth generation descendant of Richard Olmsted, a founder of Hartford and of Norwalk. Samuel's brother Nathan was a founder of our church in 1726. Their only child, Sarah Hawley, was born six months after he died from wounds sustained in the disastrous Battle of Harlem Heights in September of 1776. There are 17 revolutionary soldiers buried here at Sharp Hill, but he is the only one who died in the service of his country, as stated on his gravestone. Their child, Sarah, grew up to marry Aaron Olmsted, her second cousin, and their son was Holly Olmsted, Yale 1816 graduate of the and the founder of the Wilton Academy, a private school which provided quality education to hundreds of Wilton children throughout the 19th century. The son of Professor Holly Olmsted was Professor Edward Olmsted, and his daughter Jane was the mother of Tim Merwin, Sr. Ezekiel's descendants still live in Wilton. <laughs> okay, so my name's Jonathan Wood. I was born in Long Island in 1658, the youngest son of Timothy Wood. And as a youth, I apprenticed with the weaver to learn the trade, which was to be my profession. By the time I was 19, I purchased land in Jamaica and in Huntington, Long Island. I married my wife, Mary, in 1690, and we had seven children. Later in 1706, at the age of 48, due to some dissatisfaction with the Anglican trends in the Long Island church, and with a midlife urge to do something different, I decided to uproot my family from a pretty comfortable life and purchased about 175 acres in the wilderness at the northern end of Norwalk in an area which did not even have a road yet. It was a mile north of Pimpawag at what is now 555 Danbury Road. I built a house there in 1706, which has been rebuilt several times, but there's a large chimney base in there which is still original to the house. I also bought land in the new town of Ridgefield when it was settled in 1708. I then received permission to attend Sunday meetings there as it was closer than to Norwalk. When there was a movement in 1725 towards creating uh, our own parish of Wilton, I was an enthusiastic supporter and I signed the petition. As the oldest founder of the new church and as one of the early settlers, I received um, a seat in the prestigious Great Pew, but then died soon later on February 6, 1727. I was buried um, in the small graveyard which was surrounded by um, the first meeting house on the south side of Wolfpit Road near the present railroad tracks. After the new church was built here at Sharp Hill in 1740, the old building was sold and the land around it reverted back to farm fields. And by 1851 when the railroad was being built, nobody remembered that there was a cemetery still there. So the Irish railroad workers dug up bones of those who uh, were previously buried there. And it was reported that they went to Cable's Tavern to uh, have a drink afterwards. Um, several of the skulls were taken by some of the local youths in the area, but the majority of the bones were taken up by a local undertaker and were buried in a pine box in an unspecified location, but we think it's somewhere here in Sharp Hill Cemetery. My sons, Jonathan Jr. and Obadiah also uh, were signers of the petition, and Jonathan Jr. lived here in Wilton and raised a large family, but his final resting place is also unknown, and my other children lived all over the area, Ridgefield, Reading, and South Salem. Thank you. Thank you. So, my name is Sarah Lockwood Selick Hickox. 
Stella. So, I was married three times. So, originally, my grandfather was Robert Lockwood. And he came from, here, come move in, so I don't have to, yeah. So, uh, my, my grandfather was Robert Lockwood, and he came from England and settled in Massachusetts right off the boat. And shortly, uh, in 1630, he moved to Fairfield, Connecticut. And you think, wow, they had a Fairfield, Connecticut? Like, they're, yes, it was, you know, the the towns that are on the coast were established before the towns that were more inland. So Norwalk, uh, Milford, Fairfield, Bridgeport, all of the, the, the towns right along the coast, those were established towns because they all had ports. And this was a very active seaside uh, business. So because because we were so close to the the sound this was actually a very lucrative area to live in however that was down in norwalk once you started going into north norwalk this is considered north norwalk and as you come up here it became harder and harder to make a living because you had to do something like farm and of course it's nothing but rocks so i digress anyway so my grandfather was Robert Lockwood. He was English, and he came to this country in 1630, and he was in Fairfield. And he moved, into, he moved to Fairfield in 1646. And his son, Jonathan Lockwood, was my father. He married my mother, Mary, and I was born in Stanford in 1678. So at the age of 22, I married Nathaniel Selick, of Norwalk, and that was in 1700. So I was 22. And we had six children. And then, 12 years after we got married, six children later, he dies. He up and dies on me. This is terrible. And I have six children. And you have to remember that in those days, women had no rights. They had no property. Uh, they had no profession. So how am I going to feed my kids? I have to get married and I better make sure that I marry somebody who is, you know, has got some money. Well, I hit the jackpot and uh, I'm, I uh, met Benjamin Hickox. And Benjamin Hickox is also a third generation American and he was born in Waterbury, also another seaside community. And he was born in 1866. And at the age of 22, he moved up north to Ridgefield, which was actually Ridgefield. It was called Ridgefield. But it was still a, a territory that was shared between the early American settlers and Native Americans. So at the age of 22, he moves to Ridgefield and he buys a tract of land from Chief Katuna who was the chief of the Ramapo Native American Indian tribe. And he was one of the original proprietors of Ridgefield. He was establishing Ridgefield as being English. So he sold the land up in Ridgefield in 1711, and he brought, bought several tracts of land uh, in what is now Wilton. It was considered northern uh, Norwalk. So this is north of Norwalk. This is still part of Norwalk. And uh, he had quite a bit of land here and he was farming the land. He was also, basically he was a realtor. He was selling land and buying land, making a profit and buying more land. So he was perfect for me. He was going to be a guy, he had money and he was going to take care of my kids and he loved me because I was so beautiful. Um, and so we got married in 1714. So, and he also liked my kids. So he made a really good profit and we were able to have our first home on Ridgefield Road on the corner of what is now Nod Hill. A few years ago, they repainted the house white with the blue shutters. That, I believe that is, yes? That's what? On the corner 
Is that a store with the blue shutters? That was a store. It was the post office also. Oh, okay, I'm wrong, then that was not their house. That's, so it would have been next door to that house. Yes. Thank you for that clarification. <laughs> and it could have been, perhaps, because women didn't have, I mean, she was a pretty smart cookie too, maybe she actually ran the store. No, that, I don't think that store started until later. Well, how old are you now? What, what year, what year are you? Uh, I'm talking about like 1723. Oh, no, the store didn't start until like the Civil War. Oh, okay. Oh. Thank you for that clarification. So, um, as well as owning a lot of the land and establishing this, he was um, one of the petitioners in the uh, Norwalk church who said, this is crazy. All of the guys in Norwalk are having to commute up into Wilton to work these fields. And he was responsible for felding a lot of the trees to build the houses so uh, uh, this was really open farmland. Um, and the, if, you, if you take a walk on the um, Connecticut River Valley Trail, the Norwalk River Valley Trail, and you'll see all of these beautiful stone walls that look like they lead to nowhere, it's because all of that land was open farmland. But you'll also notice that there are a lot of really big rocks on that trail, and those rocks have been there for centuries. So they farmed around the rocks, so they couldn't really plow it very well. So most of the crops that they were growing was stuff like rye, uh, flax, things that were pretty easy to grow. And one of their biggest commodities was sheep, because the sheep could graze up and down the hills. And so this was actually a wool producing community as well as flax. So the first grist mill in Wilton was built uh, by my husband Benjamin on the Comstock, Comstock Brook, which is the little brook that goes behind what is now the, the present day um, uh, Congregational Church, like going down toward Lover's Lane. That little brook was, I think, I think, you know, it, it continues to run. It's, it's I don't know where it feeds from, but it's always running. And that was actually the power for the first grist mill in, uh, in Wilton. And later there was a sawmill that was also <coughs> had it on the same place. Um, so Benjamin, my husband, um, now we're probably in our late 40s and early 50s, and he is uh, one of the three deacons at the Congregational Church, which was here. So uh, We have 11 kids. Oh, so you, wait a minute, second husband? Second husband, we had five children. more, oh, yes. Five oh. more. Yes, so I had six, I had six kids with Nathaniel Selleck. Five? Then he died and I had to lickety split find a new husband and that's I, so I grabbed Benjamin and we had five more kids. So I, I now have one. 11 children. Many of them are buried over there. So Benjamin hadn't been married before. Correct, oh. correct. So Benjamin has five, but he helped me now take, have we have 11 kids. So it's a big family. And he was a deacon in the church and he was on the committee that established this piece of land as the new location for the congregational church because in the, the first uh, congregational church was on like, o like over by the river and that was over by um, um, Wolf Pit Road but it was too small. And as, as people in Norwalk were moving north, they needed to have a bigger meeting house. And in Norwalk, uh, you know, they had said that you have to have the church before you can establish the town. So this was all sort of happening in the same decade. So he actually helped to establish the church here with this graveyard. They needed more room for the church and the graveyard. So that was in uh, 1726 to have the new parish located here. He was one of the first three deacons and uh, let's see, he died in 1745, leaving me with 11 kids. But by that time, we were late 50s, early 60s. In fact, he, he was 59 and I would have been 51 at that time. So, so that was young, he was young. 
but that was actually considered a pretty good, oh, yeah, pretty okay, good yeah. runnings in those yeah. days. So he was almost 60 when he died, and again leaving me with now 11 children. And but at that point, my children were old enough; they were getting married, they were having families of their own, and they were basically taking care of me. But I was beautiful and <laughs> fun-loving. So in 1756, when I was 78 years old. I got married for a third time. I married a good friend who lived in Norwalk. He was 83 years old at the time, and his name was Samuel Kellogg. So he was 83, and I was 78, and uh, so and we lived down in in Norwalk. Um, he died, and I was widowed for a third time. And then when I died in 1765 at the age of 87, my Hickox children. Uh, so my the five Hickox children buried me next to Benjamin. So here's Benjamin and here's Sarah. We considered these the headstones, but in fact these are the footstones. The headstone is this little one. And as they are lying here, here's the head and the feet are up against the stone. So when you're reading the stone, you're actually they're lying prone, obviously, this way. So the head is here and the feet are up against the stone. So beyond the stone, where you're, Judy, where you're standing, there is nobody buried. So again, then the, this, this is like between the gravestones. You can see the little stones there. Those are all the headstones. And these stones here, where the writing is, that's the whole stone. So that's how they're, so, you know, when you're walking on sacred ground, you would, uh, that's why I'm sort of like, I'm here. <laughs> right, so. So that's my story. Lucky shit. <laughs>